uh, just click here to proceed. The green button, I guess. Yeah, okay. So thank you very, very much for having me. Um, yeah, um, not working. Not working. Oh, there it goes. It's too quick. Okay. So in her monography, A World History of 19th Century Archaeology, um, Margarita Diaz Andrew notes in the context of studies of colonial power regimes and its various imperial formations, a simple classification of countries into imperial powers, informal empires, and formal colonies is, however, only a helpful analytical tool that shows its flaws at close look. Considering these obs this observation in the context of collection histories, Attributions such as orientalist, manuscript hunter, or collector usually go hand in hand with binary structures of framing the actors involved in translocations of Arabic and Islamic manuscripts from the West Asian and North African region, from the WANA region, so to say. Even when considering them part of a broader network, they remain isolated points of locals, non-locals, orientalists, and orientals connected by linear strands to speak within the metaphor of a network. In this presentation, I argue that these binary ways of thinking do not necessarily correlate to the interaction and identities of the protagonists of collection histories, neither in a German nor in an international or trans-imperial context. Theoretically speaking, when thinking of foreigners or outsiders moving to a specific location to interact in one way or another with local society, one could imagine the predicament similar to the process of anthropologists entering a field. Kiri Narayan summarizes this in inevitable procedure when questioning the classifications and implications of native versus non-native anthropologists. Factors such as ed education, gender, sexual orientation, class, race, or sheer duration of context may at different times outweigh the cultural identity we associate with insider or outsider status. Reformulating the title of her article how native is a native anthropologist into a question that overlaps with the field of collection histories, we might ask then, for example, how non-local is a non-local collector, or how adventure is, it an, is an adventurer, or how local could be a non-local. Roughly orienting to this phrase then, this presentation will be a short comparative survey of a selected group of collectors who acquired written cultural artifacts from the Rwanda region to illustrate the intricacies and ambiguities of identities within each actor involved. The presentation reflects some aspects of agents in collection histories I was rethinking while reading and writing for my PhD project, inspired by approaches of Konrad Hirschler, Jean-Paul Rubiral, and Simon Mills, who also try to reorient, so to say, the understanding of collections and their composition. I will start by taking a closer look at a Prussian collector who acquired around 2,200 objects and sold them to the institution that ultimately has become the host of this conference the Prussian consulate manuscript translocator Johann Gottfried Wettstein. As Prussian consul and scholar, he was resident in Damascus from 1849 till 1862, pursuing his consular obligations and acquiring manuscripts during the course of his stay. Wettstein's interaction with the Damascene manuscript dealer will be put in relation to two other collectors of the 19th century and their engagement with their surroundings, namely Edward Henry Palmer, who will be in the main focus here, and Francis Stuart Drake, these British collectors managed to sell 44 fragments to the Cambridge University Library that bear a Damascene provenance. Being framed as Orientalist, adventurer, and manuscript hunter, Palmer traveled together with Drake at the Arab Ottoman lands in the late 1860s for three years, particularly the Desert of Tea, the Sinai region, and then further to North Arabia and to Damascus. To further complicate the dichotomizing ways of framing translocation processes, I will briefly refer to another act character I consider to be an exceedingly complex chess piece and who may stimulate further research discussions in the future. Ultimately then, in this paper, I want to move away from a preset configuration of collectors, manuscript hunters and the likes as a presu presumably homogeneous block or group of people who were undergoing the same endeavor and are positioned in contrast to local society, complicating their roles and situatedness within histories of manuscript translocations. Damascus is the key provenance information here for choosing the, uh, them as comparative figures, since both the adventurer couple Palmer Drake and Wettstein acquired material from the same manuscript repository, the Qubbat al-Khazna of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. 
This dome of treasury is an octagonal construct in the courtyard of the mosque that used to hold multilingual manuscripts until the early 20th century. As has been shown by François de Roche, Christoph Rauch, and Boris Liebrens, the Quran of Amadjur, a 30 juz mushaf bearing an endowment note on each recto folio, was once stored in the Qubba. Now most of the material can be found in the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts in Istanbul in a collection called Sham Evraklara, yani Awraq al-Sham, meaning Damascus papers, so to say. Um, other parts of the Amadjur manuscripts are scattered in various repositories of Europe and the Wana region, amongst them the collection of Wettstein in Berlin and of Palmer and Drake in Cambridge. But having access in one way to another or another to the same source corpus does not inform about the process or profile of the translocations and their agents. Although Palmer and Drake were portraying themselves similarly to Wettstein as some form of connoisseurs of local societies, I cr a critical reading of the sources under scope here paint a picture I consider opposite to Wettstein and his interaction with local actors in their ventures for manuscripts. Since I could not identify any autographic source that illustrates such interactions explicitly, as, Wettstein, uh, as in Wettstein's case, I will give a short insight into their perception of their surrounding and interaction with local society from the pr fr primary sources available, containing understudied material from the Cambridge University Library Archive and St. John's College in Cambridge, next to others. Thus, the different ways of perceiving of and interacting with their respective social environment might be accounted as one reason for them returning with much lesser written cultural artifacts than Wettstein did. So, turning to Wettstein now, Ingeborg Huhn, Christoph Rauch, Boris Liebrens and others have already noted what a complex character Wettstein embodied and how his network of people shaped his collection endeavors. To briefly demonstrate how Wettstein was capable of growing into society, I will mainly reassess material that has recently been elaborated by Christoph Rauch, namely a notification letter written by Wettstein to the Prussian Royal Library, from a slightly shifted perspective. In this letter, Wettstein depicted the situ situation in which he was active as a European acquirer of manuscripts as muddled and unfavorable. According to his writings, acquiring manuscripts was quotation, connected to great difficulties, and the comp competition in manuscript trade was intensified by British and American travelers and missionaries at that time. He complains about them buying everything that is old, as he says, which ultimately led to the loss of, quoting him again, a lot of good stuff, but above all drove up prices. Vechten did not receive an expense allowance for managing the Prussian consulate in Damascus during this time. Rauch has already pointed out that budgetary constraints played a considerable, sometimes omnipresent, existential and existential role in the life of acquisitioners working for or selling European institu for set to European institutions, such as the Prussian Royal Library. Wettstein also explains his impression of how local society viewed the Europeans' buying efforts, postulating that buying books is hateful among them. Wettstein, however, was not so much concerned with the loss of cultural heritage for Islamic head societies, but with the practical use of manuscripts that would be lost in the hands of the British and the French, as he says. Wettstein closes his account on the local society's perception of a manuscript drained to Europe by stating that these are the views of educated Ar Arabs in general, and they all, therefore, find it extremely difficult to discard old manuscripts, as he says. It is this challenging situation of Damascene book market um, of the Damascene book market in which Wettstein portrayed himself. A constellation in which a character, as Wettstein says, quotation, with exact knowledge of the printed and unprinted Arabic literature already present or still missing in our libraries, quotation, end of quotation, is required. In line with this narrative um, in the notification letter, Wettstein self-situating -situ self, um, in and familiarity with Damascene society were the distinct parameters that enabled him to acquire manuscripts, despite the problematic situation he was facing throughout his ventures. Wettstein considered himself an expert and connoisseur of local society and, as we might see then, must have indeed left a considerable, considerable, considerable mark on local society. The way Wettstein situates himself is further stressed by his account uh, of the relationship with a local manuscript dealer, literally, literally recorded in his notification letter, Sheikh Jamal or Ahmed al-Misri. According to Wettstein, El Misir was a book and antique broker who had been in the business for 40 to 45 years, as he says. Wettstein does not inform us where he met or got to know, a quotation now, the only Mohammedan who trades with us for money, but the first time, but gives, but for the first time gives a fairly detailed and derogative description of El Misri, saying 
Every European who has made purchases in Damascus knows this strange old man, a curious figure of trustworthiness and mischievousness, calm and affected rage. As we can see, he not only describes him as an indispensable source for the purchase of manuscripts, but also pays respect to him and acknowledges his role, albeit in a modestly condescending manner. To a similar degree of detail, Vechtan illustrates the procedure of negotiating and handing over the manuscripts. El Misri usually brought his material in a sack to Vechtan and left immediately so that no one could see the handing over taking place. After Vechtan could have had a first look at the manuscripts El Misri, Misri garnered, the Sheikh visited Vechtan directly at his house in the Turkish quarters to negotiate the transaction at a second meeting. In accordance with an agreement between Vechtan and El Misri, the Sheikh had to show each manuscript he acquired to Vechtan first before offering it to other Europeans. In return, Vechtan had to pay El Misri one piaster for each manuscript he could inspect, regardless of whether he would bought it later on or not. What shines through here, I briefly want to mention this, is the agency El Misri articulated towards Vechtan. He did not just let Vechtan act and write on unsold manuscripts as he pleased, but El Misri installed an economic gate fee for Vechtan. Wettstein got approval of him being the privileged one to see the manuscripts first when he considered the material he recognized in the hands of missionaries and other European actors, because as he says, by far the largest part of the MSS that I saw at the missionaries had the black mark on the first page, which I have imprinted in every book for which I had paid one piaster. The information Wettstein provided here not only implies the existence of probably several hundred or thousand manuscripts bearing a Damascene provenance, we do not know about yet, but also offers some useful insight into Wettstein's collecting practice and his socio-anthropological localization in Damascene society. Firstly, he was indeed capable of negotiating with a local manuscript dealer in Bilad Hashem, and he did so to a considerable degree. Although he had to pay for the first sight of manuscripts, he managed to establish this privileging habit for himself and got the permission to write on unsold manuscripts. In fact, manuscripts he would in the end never buy. The embeddedness of Wettstein must have played a crucial role in enabling this back and forth and brokering for the desired material and the permission to leave his mark. In fact, El Misri was even eager to sell material to Wettstein, constantly praising what he brought for him and, swear and swearing, quotation, by the head of this boy, 10 times a minute, not infrequently also by the life of his gray, gray beard, as Wettstein says, about the quality of his material. How difficult it could have been for collectors to bring about negoci negotiations to such an extent, extent could be exemplified by other Prussian collectors of the 19th century, such as Ulrich Jaspersitzen. Although he ended up bringing around 1,400 manuscripts to the University Library of Göttingen, buying manuscripts in, Bil in Bilad Sham of the 19th century gave him, as he stated in his diary during his stay in Aleppo, an extraordinary amount of trouble. Ahmed al-Shamsi beautifully showed how desperate Zitzin must have been when Zitzin saw the manuscript stored in the central mosque of Fustat, trying to bribe the female caretakers, as he says, ultimately not being successful in retrieving them in the first place. As we know by now, somehow he somehow managed to get some of the ancient Qur'ans he was looking for in the end. But I guess Feras Kimsi will tell us more about this later on. Secondly, the social anthropological aspect of imprinting someone's signature or mark onto material reflects on Wettstein claiming his place in Damascene society. It is this materialization of impact that further stresses the complex entanglement of various actors in the context of translocation processes of cultural artifacts. And it is not only the fact that some European inscribe some form of mark on manuscripts, but also the way, in this case, some form of consensus through negotiation in which it came about. For Wettstein's case then, we might get a glimpse by now of how he was diving into and engaging with Damascene society and book trade, leaving his mark not only on objects, but also on subjects. Although Wettstein was a child of his times, times and thus not immune to racist ideologies, the material of Wettstein's bequests elaborated by Ingeborg Huhn in her dissertation already paints a picture in which Wettstein demonstrates a differentiated approach to local actors shimmering, shimmering through his writings. For example, one of the former employees of, Prussian, of the Prussian consulate under Wettstein's supervision, Khalil al-Basha, wrote a letter to him asking for Wettstein to support his son in traveling to Berlin for studying Orientalism. Huhn has already referred to this 
to his close connection to Wettstein. And Wettstein as a character must have indeed inspired Elbasha in one way or another. And, and, and to an extent, he became somewhat of a role model for him and his son. Wettstein then, as I argue, was much more than an Orientalist or consul. He, he became embedded in society. Maybe a semi-local? I don't know. And established a bond between him and local actors, as well as leaving his footprint in Damascene book culture and society. To the contrary, the ways in which Palmer and Drake interacted with their field, to speak in an anth an anthropological terms, reflect on what I frame here as deviating from Wettstein's approach and interaction with his environment. Palmer was a trained Orientalist at St. John's College in Cambridge, who made various trips to the Wana region and acquired, together with Drake, some 44 Kufi Quranic fragments they sold to the Cambridge University Library. He cataloged the Persian, Arabic, and Turkish manuscripts of King's College and Trinity College before ever traveling. In 1868, he traveled to Palestine as part of the Ordnance Survey Expedition and at the behest of the Palestine Exploration Fund of the Palestine Exploration Society for the topographical survey of the Sinai area with a special interest in, in, in inscriptions. On December 16, 1869, he teamed up with Turwood Drake as his traveling companion. The journey took them to Lebanon from where they continued to no north to Damascus. Depicted as St. John's Lawrence of Arabia, as, as the St. John's College themselves call him, a manuscript hunter, I argue that Palmer in particular was not only not successful in collecting manuscripts because of his pronounced orientalist and phrenologist, in fact, way of perceiving and interacting with his local society, but also that it seems that he was in fact not really interested in, interested in collecting manuscripts. While Wettstein mentions Jamal al Misri by name, gives a detailed description of the process of acquiring manuscripts in general and recounts of his access to Kufic fragments from Damascus, Palmer and Drake do not talk in their writings about any successful acquisition of any manuscript, as Wettstein did in his correspondences and autographic catalogues. Building upon Fabio Iopoulou and uh, Andrew Dalby, acquiring the Quranic fragments can only be determined in the last part of the 1869 or 1867 joint journey to Damascus. In fact, sold on March 3rd, 1875, the library syndicate minute books refer to the sale only once, stating that Palmer received 130 pounds for the Kufic fragments in question here. Since the Kufic Quran fragments seem to be the only manuscripts they acquired, I further argue that Palmer and Drake may have perceived, purchased or received them on occasion, and not so much because they were on the lookout for them in particular, or had an initial interest in manuscripts or in the Qubba. Palmer did make attempts to buy Arabic manuscripts in 1869, though, as the Cambridge University Gazette postulates that he received 200 pounds for acquiring some, stating that the sum of 200 pounds granted by grace of the Senate of November 12, 1868 from the Words Traveling Bachelors Fund to E. H. Palmer, B. A. St. John's, having proved insufficient for the purpose, purposes named in that grace, a further sum of 200 pounds will be voted to Mr. Palmer. So this statement here implies that Palmer had already received 200 pounds for acquiring books and relics of antiquity, but seemed to have failed in doing so. Palmer's failure in acquiring Arabic manuscripts prompted the Cambridge University Library to grant another 200 pounds as a second chance, demanding a report and the ownership of all objects purchased by the money. In October of the same year, Palmer reported about his ventures and the task that came along with the second 200 pounds he had received, saying, a grant having been made for the words traveling bachelor's fund to enable me to purchase oriental books and manuscripts, I have endeavored to embody in the following report a statement of the results of my mission. According to Palmer's report, it was for the first time that he engaged with Arabic manuscripts, as it seems, as a material of particular interest in his ventures. The aspect of Palmer being unacquainted with manuscript trade in general and not embedded in local society in particular, along with the short duration of his stay in Cairo, I see as decisive reason, decisive reasons why he obtained only printed books at that point. It was impossible during so short a stay in Cairo to make any extensive purchases of manuscripts, as he says, and I therefore determined to restrict myself to making a selection of printed works which should supply the chief deficiencies which I know to exist in the university library. Thanks to the assistance of advice of Mr. Ayrton, an English gentleman and scholar residing at Cairo and LA of the Turkish Empire, and with the kind cooperation of Hussein Bey and other Egyptian authorities, I have pro procured a number of standard works selected especially for the purpose of illustrating the literature, history, and theology of the East. 
Here we can see the trouble for some effort that it already took to obtain printed works since Palmer already needed several local helping hands for acquiring them, let alone handwritten material as shown by his previous unsuccessful attempts. Although Palmer puts it, puts it as if just extensive purchases of manuscripts were impossible for him, meaning small amounts could have been possible during his stay in Cairo, he was, according to his own report, not capable of acquiring a single manuscript whatsoever. Next to Palmer's lack of time and knowledge about manuscript trade, his thoroughly racist phonologist philosophy poses another aspect I consider crucial in hindering him from engaging with locals to an extent Vechtan was capable of. Seraj Asi analyzes Palmer's and other British explorers' racist perception of the Bedouin in particular and the Arabs in general. He exposes a new level of obsession of British adventurers and Orientalists with phrenological studies of Bedouins and Arabs, a new breed, as he says, of British explorers whose interest in the Bedouin went far beyond the romantic legacy of the 18th century. And Palmer, Palmer was an advocate of that doctrine. In his scrapbook, Palmer draws his local companions in a typical exoticizing fashion, usually positioning them between camels and sitting on the ground, or showing them in a serving manner stressing their Arabness. Along these painted lines, Palmer's travel notebook then feeds into a narrative what Asi outlines as a declensionist Arab narrative on the Arabs as, inherently as an inherently destructive race. Already in the first entry of his travel notebook, Palmer complains about an ill-tempered Barbary Negro who seemingly was the guard of the place where Palmer wanted to drop his luggage when reaching the Shat al-Bahr, so the, basically the beach area. Uh, the pier belonged to a French company and was still under construction, as he states, and the local guard hired from the French company was in fact just doing his job, asking for a written order from the company and official permission to step on the uh, foot on this part of the coast. The quotation here hints towards how Palmer featured what Asi observed as an ev evident hostility towards local society and how he entered the field. Whenever Palmer talks about his local companions, he mainly refers to them in a despising way as our, our Arabs a discursive claim of superiority I have not observed in Vegetarian's writings so far. Um, Palmer had no problem in making use of his unequally powerful position as a representative of the Palestine Exploration Funds. On November 14, he, uh, he brought on a debate that place took place between two sheikhs who were accompanying him on his travels. In order to prevent them from reincinerating their discussion, he threatened them to write to the consul and say how troublesome they were. The powerful... The power of a consul was an omnipresent instrument for taming local actors, as Palmer himself explains the nature of Arabs and the power strands of a consul in his book, The Desert of Exodus, by the credo, fear God and the consul. So, as we might realize by now, both Vechtan and the adventurer couple Palmer and Drake were not sharing the same precise social localization within societies of the Wana region, and were not collectors of the same format. Finally, I'm coming to an end now. I would like to briefly refer to another figure in the context of collection histories of manuscripts of the Wana region who, to my knowledge, has no direct corpus-related connection to Qubba material, but who also acquired manuscripts with, with, with the Damascene provenance. Um, before going into this character, who will be Abraham Shalom Yehuda, I briefly want to thank the Yehuda Seminar at Princeton University in general, and Garrett Davidson in particular, for sharing their outstanding knowledge with me and triggering some, in triggering some intriguing thoughts about manuscript acquisitions of the 19th and early 20th century. So, coming briefly back to Yehuda now, just to give you an idea about what he actually was, or what he was not. A native Arabic and Hebrew-speaking Jewish apprentice of Theodor Nöldike and Ignaz Goldsier, manuscript collector and broker who lived in Jerusalem, Frankfurt am Main, Nuremberg, Berlin, Madrid, London, and New York, and was constantly on the hunt for manuscripts. So this character basically unhinges all kind of categories that we were speaking about in the context of manuscript collection and manuscript hunting, oriental, orientalist, and so forth. So the main object to finalize now of this paper was to move further towards a differentiated framing of participants in manuscript translocations from the Wana region. 
contributing to a debate on translocations in proto-Cornolian context, not being reduced to a two-dimensional comparison and extrapolation between outsiders and insiders. In using the example of Wettstein, I wanted to demonstrate the European manuscript acquisitioners were partly deeply embedded in and also dependent on local societies, acknowledging the ambiguous degrees of layers of entanglement between subjects and objects might favor a more ethical approach to and decolonial narratives of manuscript translocations. Thank you very much for your attendance and your patience.